This is the Air Jordan 3 Black Cement. This might be the most important sneaker in history. First released in 1988, this is the shoe that started Nike marketing as we know it. This is the shoe that propelled the entire Air Jordan lineage, and perhaps saved Nike. The Air Jordan 3 Black Cement did for sneakers what the iPhone did for phones. It's been re-released four times. Every celebrity has been seen wearing it. There's a site about what to wear with the black cement. It's been right under your nose for decades, and you never look down. And right about now, most of you are probably thinking, sneakers? <laughs> yes, yes, sneakers. Some extraordinary things about sneakers, and data, and Nike. And how they're all related, possibly, to the future of all online commerce. In 2011, the last time the Jordan 3 Black Sim was released at a retail of $160, it sold out globally in minutes. And that's because people were camped outside of sneaker stores for days before it went on sale. And just minutes after that, thousands of those pairs were on eBay for two and three times retail. In fact, there's over a thousand pairs on eBay right now, four years later. And here's the thing: this happens every single Saturday. Every week, there's another release or two or three, and every shoe has a story as rich and compelling as the Jordan 3 Black Cement. This is Nike building the marketplace for sneakerheads, people who collect sneakers, and my daughter. <laughs> It's an "I Love Dad" T-shirt. For the brands, sneakerheads are a very important demographic. These are the tastemakers. These are the Apple fanboys, because who else is going to buy a pair of eight thousand dollar Back to the Future sneakers? <laughs> yeah, eight thousand dollars. And while that's obviously the anomaly, the resale sneaker market is definitely not. Thirty years in the making, what started as an underground culture of a few people who like sneakers just a bit too much. <laughs> Now we have sneaker addictions, and a market where in the past 12 months there have been over nine million pairs of shoes resold in the United States alone, at a value of 1.2 billion dollars, and that's a conservative estimate. I should know. I am a sneakerhead. This is my collection. In the pantheon of great collections, mine doesn't even register. I have about 250 pairs, but trust me, I am small time. People have thousands. I'm a very typical 37-year-old sneakerhead. <laughs> I grew up playing basketball, and Michael Jordan played. I always wanted Air Jordans. My mother would never buy me Air Jordans. As soon as I got some money, I bought Air Jordan. Literally, we all have the exact same story. But here's where mine diverged. After starting three companies, I took a job as a strategy consultant, where I very quickly realized that I didn't know the first thing about data. But I learned because I had to, and I liked it. So I thought, I wonder if I get a hold of some sneaker data, just to play with for my own amusement. The goal was to develop a price guide, a real data-driven view of the market. And four years later, we're analyzing over 25 million transactions, providing real-time analytics on thousands of sneakers. Now sneakerheads check prices while camping out for releases. Others have used the data to validate insurance claims. And the top investment banks in the world now use resale data to analyze the retail footwear industry. And here's the best part: sneakerheads have sneaker portfolios. <laughs> sneakerheads can track the value of their collection over time compared to others, and have access to the same analytics you might your online brokerage account. So, sneakerhead Dan builds his collection and identifies which 352 are his. He can see it's worth $103,000. Frankly, a modest collection. At the asset level, he can see gain loss by shoe. Here, he's made over six hundred dollars on one pair. I have one of those. <laughs> so, an unregulated one point two billion dollar industry that thrives as much on the street as it does online, and has spawned fundamental financial services for sneakers. At some point, I asked myself, what's really going on in the market? And two comparisons started to emerge. Are sneakers more like stocks or drugs? 
In fact, one guy emailed to say he thought his 15-year-old son was selling drugs, and later found out he was selling sneakers. <laughs> and now they use the data to do it together. And that's because sneakers are an investment opportunity where none other exist. And I don't just mean the kids selling sneakers instead of drugs. How about all kids? You have to be 18 to play the stock market. I sold chewing gum in sixth grade, blow pops in ninth grade, and collected baseball cards through high school. But cards are long dead, and the candy market is usually quite local. For a lot of people, sneakers are the only legal and accessible investment opportunity, a democratized stock market. But also unregulated, which is why the story you're probably most familiar with is people killing each other for sneakers. And while that definitely happens and is tragic, it's not nearly the epidemic some media would have you believe. In fact, it's a very small piece of a much bigger and better story. So sneakers have clear similarities to both the stock exchange and the illegal drug trade, but perhaps the most fundamental is the existence of a central actor. Someone is making the rules. In the case of sneakers, that someone is Nike. Let me walk you through some numbers. The resale market we know is 1.2 billion. Nike, including Jordan brand, accounts for 96 percent of all shoes sold on the secondary market. Just complete domination. Sneakerheads love Jordans, and profit on the secondary market is about a third. That means that sneakerheads made $380 million selling Nikes last year. Let's jump to retail for a second. Skechers earlier this year became the number two footwear brand in the country, surpassing Adidas. This was a big deal. And in the 12 months ending June, Skechers' net income was $209 million. That means that Nike's customers. Make almost twice as much profit as their closest competitor. That <laughs> how is that even possible? The sneaker market is just supply and demand, but Nike has gotten very good at using supply, limited sneakers, and the distribution of those sneakers to their own benefit. So it's really just supply. Sneakerheads joke as long as it's limited, and Nike they'll buy it. Shoes that sell for eight thousand dollars do so because they're very rare. It's no different than any other collectible market. Only, this isn't a market at all. It's a false construct created by Nike, ingeniously created by Nike in the most positive sense to sell more shoes, and in the process has provided tens of thousands of people with lifelong passions, myself included. If Nike wanted to kill the resale market, they could do so tomorrow. All they have to do is release more shoes. But we certainly don't want them to, nor is it in their best interest. That's because, unlike Apple, who will sell an iPhone to anyone who wants one, Nike doesn't make their money by just selling 200-hour sneakers. They sell millions of shoes to millions of people for $60, and sneakerheads are the ones that drive the marketing and the hype and the PR and the brand cachet and enable Nike to sell millions of $60 sneakers. It's marketing. It's marketing the likes of which has never been seen before. This isn't in any textbook. For 15 years, Nike has propped up an artificial commodities market with a Facebook-level hyped IPO every single weekend. Try by any Foot Locker at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and there will be a line down the street and around the block. And sometimes those kids have been waiting there all week. You know those crazy iPhone lines you see on the news every other year? Nike lines happen 104 times more often. So Nike sets the rules, and they do so by controlling supply and distribution. But once a pair leaves the retail channel, it's the wild west. There are very few, if any, legal, unregulated markets of this size. So Nike is definitely not the stock exchange. In fact, there is no central exchange. By last count, there are 48 different online markets that I know of. Some are eBay clones. Some are mobile markets. And then you have consignment shops and brick-and-mortar stores, and sneaker conventions, and reseller sites, and Facebook, and Instagram, and Twitter, and literally anywhere. Sneakerheads come into contact with each other. Shoes will be bought and sold. But that means no efficiencies, no transparency, 
sometimes not even authenticity. Can you imagine if that's how stocks were bought? What if the way to buy a share of Apple stock was to search over 100 places online and off, including every time you walk down the street, just hoping to pass someone wearing some Apple stuff, <laughs> never knowing who had the best price, or even if the stock you were looking at was real? That would surely make you say, <laughs> "Of course, that's not how we buy stock." But what if that's not how we buy sneakers either? What if the inverse is true? And what if we could buy sneakers exactly the same way as we buy stock? And what if it wasn't just sneakers? There was any similar product, like watches and handbags and women's shoes and any collectible, any seasonal item, and any markdown item. What if there was a stock market for commerce, a stock market of things? And not only could you buy in a much more educated and efficient manner. But you can engage in all the sophisticated financial transactions you can with the stock market: shorts and options and futures. And well, maybe you see where this is going. Maybe you want to invest in the stock market of things. Because if you had invested in a pair of Air Jordan Three Black Cement in 2011, you could either be wearing them on stage, <laughs> or have earned 162 percent on your money. Double the S and P, and 20 percent more than Apple. <laughs> and that's why we're talking about sneakers. Thank you.